today we're going to take communion and uh, get a fresh cleansing from the Lord. And so we'll kind of be preparing for that. And uh, I'd like to have the communion served early on today. So feel free to go ahead and get it. But before we do that, let's just um, thank the Lord for the new day. Let's say this together. Thank you, Lord, for this new day. Today I'm going to hear God's word and allow it to do a good work in me. I'm going to hear it and keep it and do it. Amen. So today um, I'd like to share with you a message um, about God's mercy. This just comes from Peter 1st verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 3 of Peter. And I'll read the scripture and then we'll talk about it. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What that's saying is when it says he's begotten us again, that means born again. See, sin brings death, and the first life we have as a flesh creature, we're born of human beings, that's a life of death because it's a life of sin, it's a life of death, and we don't want to stay in that spot. And so it says, he's begotten us again. That means being born again. And God put that in nature for us to understand about how to get a new start. Because a lot of people say, hey, my life is a train wreck. Uh, my life's falling apart, so how can it ever be good? And the answer is very simple. God transforms us. We've been begotten again. And in nature, when you look at the caterpillar, and when the light comes, and it enters, actually enters into the caterpillar, it actually enters into it, that's when the caterpillar starts to grow wings. The worm gets wings. A worm with wings. So sometimes when people say they don't feel like very good about themselves, they refer to themselves as a worm. Have you noticed the name worm is a put down? Mm -hmm. when, when a girl will go out with a guy and they said, how was your day? And she says, he was a real worm. So the name worm is a put down. Why is it that we have chosen the word worm as a put down? Because we know that the worm isn't what it's supposed to be. It, it's not become what it's, it's just a worm. Sometimes we feel like I'm just a worm. But the thing is, God says he's begotten us again. And so we're not just a worm. We're growing wings. We're becoming something better. And sometimes we may not feel it. So we need to actually say it. We need to say God is doing a good work in me. Let's say that together. God is doing a good work in me. And then let's say this. I am becoming a wonderful person. Now, the reason we say that is that's your faith talking. Because we don't always feel like wonderful people. Especially when we blow it. We don't always act the right way. And, but that's not who you are. That's not who you are. Um, see, everybody makes mistakes. But we're not a mistake. Because God doesn't make mistakes. He says when he created us, he made us awesome. And so we're in this shift where we're becoming something. And while we're in the process of doing this, in this same verse, I'm going to read the first part again. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, and that's really the message today is God has abundant mercy for us. So like when our life's been off track or we haven't, maybe we're just disappointed with ourselves. Have you ever been just disappointed with yourself? Just, man, I 
I didn't do as good as I wanted to. I'm just disappointed. Well, here's the good news. When it says that God has abundant mercy, that means he's got an unlimited supply of mercy. It's not like God runs out of mercy. And sometimes maybe we don't feel that way because maybe we're not as merciful as God is. But as we become more and more like the Lord, we increase with the mercy that we give to others. We're more and more likely to give other people a break. We're more and more likely to let other people off the hook when they're not behaving well. We say, well, you know, they're just having a bad day. And we, we let it go. And why do we let it go? Because we understand that God has abundant mercy, a limitless supply of mercy. So no matter how off track or how messed up or how many mistakes a person makes, it's not like God says, okay, you blew it, done with you. Now people do that. People write people off, don't they? Some people say, I'm done with them. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't do that with us. And we need to know this. And the reason we need to know this is so that when we mess up or when we're not doing well, sometimes we're just not behaving our best. Instead of running away from God, we do just the opposite. We run to God. We come run to him because we know the Father's like this with open arms full of abundant mercy, all the mercy we need. And then it says in Peter 1, 4, the very next verse, it says, you know, all fathers, good fathers have inheritances for their children. Uh, it says that a good father not only leaves an inheritance for his children, but he leaves an inheritance for his children's children's children. A good father leaves an inheritance. Our Heavenly Father has left a spiritual inheritance for us. We may not be able to physically see it, but that spiritual inheritance is there, and it says in the very next verse, verse sorry, to, he leaves us an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that will not fade away, reserved, where? In heaven, for you. What does that mean? God's got all this awesome stuff just waiting for you. But he stored it up in heaven because what happens to things on earth? They get moldy, they rust, they corrupt, they fall apart. So God's inheritance is incorruptible. It won't rust. It won't mold. It won't fade away. It won't disappear. And it won't be destroyed by a bad economy. In other words, God has a blessing, an inheritance stored up for you that nobody can take away from you. He has all these good things for us. And if we only knew, if we only fully understood all the good things God has for us, all the plans and the blessings and the inheritance, we would never be depressed. We would never be discouraged. See, some people, if they have a lot of money in the bank, what do they say? I'm set for life. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that saying? Say, I've got no worry because my wallet's fat. I'm set for life. That's kind of a silly thing to say because life on earth comes to an end, doesn't it? Here's the good news. With God and his inheritance, you're not set for life. You're set for eternity. You're set forever. It's the best inheritance you could ever have. This is why it says in the Bible, don't just think on the things of earth, but think about the things which are above, where you're going, 
where you're headed, what's in your future. And that's why we can say, God has a bright future for me. God has a bright future for you. Why? Why can we say this? Because we believe by faith his promises. He's got abundant mercy. The sin will not keep you from God's purpose and blessing and destiny as long as you're willing to confess it to him and keep running back to him every time. And don't just run to him when you mess up. Run to him when things are going good. See, part of the problem is some people, when things are going well, that's when they say, I'll see you later, God. I got no problems. Things are going well. We know this to be true by human nature because when 9-11 happened, the churches were packed. Yes. Just packed for a while. For a few months. And then when things got back to normal, and it, well, okay, I'm not worried anymore. I guess I'll quit going to church. But we don't go to church because we have problems. We go to church because we love God and we want to show our love to him. That's the real reason. Many people don't think of God as a person with needs. This may sound ridiculous to you, but God needs your love. God wants your love. You could say, oh, God doesn't need my love. He's God. Well, if you read in the book of Revelation, it says that we were created to love God. We were created to have a relationship with God and to love him and to give him our love. Sometimes people feel like, well, what can I really do for God? I don't feel like I'm very talented or maybe I don't have tons of money. What can I do for God? The greatest thing you can do for God is give him your love. That's what worship is all about. It's an expression of your love to God. And I don't know if you thought about this, but if a person is a real person in a relationship, if it's a real relationship, they want your love. They want your love, and God wants your love. So think in a different way. Think in the terms of you have something to give, something very precious to God, yourself your love. You have that. The amazing thing is God created us so we get to choose whether we love him or not. But think about that. God arranged it. He wants your love. He wants your attention. Don't, don't we all want attention? Do you like being ignored? I don't. God wants your attention. He wants your love. But he created you in such a way that you get to choose whether you give him your love and attention or not. And too many people are hung up on the fact that they're not perfect. Oh, I messed up. I don't see how I can be close to God. That's got nothing to do with it. That's got nothing to do with it. See, you can be close to God even though you've messed up. And you say, well, how can I do that? It's called the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and made it possible for us to be close to God even when we're messing up because the blood of Jesus washes away all sin. So you can be as close to God as you want to be regardless of whatever mistakes you've made. It's no surprise to God. There's nothing you could do to shock God. He already knows the way you are anyway, so none of, none of it is a surprise to him. But he just wants to be close to you, and he, he'd like it if you come to him. And before we take the communion, I want to show you another scripture in this chapter because you might say, what's your calling? Have you ever had, had somebody ask that? What's your calling? And most people, when they think what their calling is, they think of doing something. 
you know. I'm called to be an auto mechanic. I'm called to be a teacher. I'm called to be a skateboarder. I'm called to be a musician. I'm called to be an artist. I'm called to be a poet, and I know it. I'm called to be this, I'm called to be that. But I want you to see what, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> I want you to see why we take the communion and what we're actually called to do, because it says in Peter 1.15 what we're called to do. And it's not, it's not a thing. It's a state of being. It says in 115, but as he which has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of behavior, because it is written, be you holy, for I am holy. So what's your calling? Be to be holy. <coughs> and I think the word holy sometimes intimidates people or scares people because me be holy? Are you kidding? I cuss and swear. How can I be holy? You are called to be holy. And being holy has to do with I want you to hear this really carefully because this is the key. Because you know, the Bible says that King David was holy, but he did a lot of naughty things in his life. And yet God said, he's holy. So how can this be? God is not looking for a perfect person that never makes mistakes. God is looking for a person who has a perfect heart toward him. And you say, what does that mean? A perfect heart toward God is a heart that wants to please God, a heart that wants to obey God, and a heart that wants to do the right thing and a heart that doesn't want to upset God in any way. When we understand this, we can be close to God even though we didn't live a perfect life. Only Jesus lived a perfect life. And if we go through life thinking we can't be close to the Lord unless we live a perfect life, that will actually keep us from being close to the Lord because that is not reality. Everybody makes mistakes and nobody lives a perfect life except Jesus. And this is why we take the communion. The blood, the, the little juice we drink. I can't call it wine. It's not a bottle of wine. It's, we're drinking a little cup here. But the juice that we drink represents the blood of Jesus that washes away all the sins so that we can be close to the Lord. And so remember, anything that you've done that you know was a mistake or not a good idea, that's no surprise to God. He already knows. And he really doesn't want us to make a big deal out of it. He just wants us to be able to be honest with him. And when we do that, we get the cleansing. And so the other thing that we need to remember as we take the communion, which we'll do soon, is that forgiveness is the key because it's not just asking God to forgive you, but to make sure that you've forgiven everybody else because how can you ask God to forgive you and then hold grudges against other people? It just doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. We can't come to God and go, please forgive me for this and that, and then, and then still stay mad at other people. So as you let that abundant mercy get into your heart, you will forgive everyone, and you'll get to a point where the person that you're upset with, how do you know when the full 
full forgiveness is completed, how do you know? I'm going to tell you. You will know when the full forgiveness has taken place, when you hear that person's name and it no longer makes you cringe. I'm serious. When that happens, you know God has completed the work. Because there were times in my life when there were certain people that, let's just say they weren't members of my fan club, okay? I would hear their name, someone would mention their name, and I would just cringe. And the Lord said, do you know why you're cringing? And I said, could it be that the forgiveness is not complete? And he said, that's right. So let's finish it. Let's finish it. And you will come to the place. It's a great freedom when someone who used to annoy you, and you couldn't even stand the sound of their name, when you can hear the name, and it, it doesn't affect you that way anymore. It can be done. Before we go into this, I'm going to play a song that has to do with this called All is Forgiven. It's a song that was written specifically for this. And so you can reflect on this while the song's being played. It gives you a chance to get ready to forgive. See, forgiveness isn't, we need to prepare our hearts to forgive. It's, it's not like, you know, little kids, you know, have you seen little kids and, and parents are trying to, you know, little kids are smacking each other and hitting each other. You know how they do that. And the parents come up and go, now you forgive one another. And then the kid goes, I forgive you. But they didn't, their heart wasn't prepared to forgive. You can't just command forgiveness. You have to engage your heart. And so let the Lord show you. One of the ways the Lord helped me to forgive people whose names made me cringe was he showed me that they're human beings with problems and I actually felt sorry for that person. And then I was able to forgive because I understood why they behaved the way they did. That's called compassion, by the way. Amen. So, um, I'm going to play this song. It won't be long. No, it's not. The Bible says that when somebody says something um, hurtful, and I think we've all had people do that, somebody said something hurtful, and you know, then the enemy comes and he he keeps reminding you of what that person said. Yes. That keeps running over and over and over again. For some of us, it, us, it's a family member or a parent or a friend who betrayed you or but somebody said something that was very hurtful and you keep thinking about that thing that they said don't let that tape keep playing in your head because though in, in, in the Bible it says when people say things unkind things it says pay it no mind just let it bounce off you don't let it get inside you because the words that people say only have power when you give it power. And so as we learn to let the unkind words bounce off, the Lord can free us.